How you doing? Good? All right. We're going to go on a little tour today. Um, I want to talk about whether or not big data can fix healthcare. I remember when I was introduced to Ed and um, told him a little bit about the things that I'd done and, and um, just the opportunities that I see in front of us. And he said, oh my god, you, you have to come and share some of the stories of things that you've seen and things that you've tried, things that you've been successful at, things that you've failed at. Please come and share some of your stories. And so I said, absolutely. Um, a little bit about me that puts some of the stories that I want to share in context. I am an actuary, um, and I've done a lot of things in healthcare. I've got about 20 years within the healthcare industry. And a lot of them, actually, I've spent more time out of the traditional actuarial uh, science field as I've spent in it. And that view, working in everything from electronic medical records companies to consulting firms putting together risk deals for providers, running a PBM, and in the most recent tenure, actually having a computational science team that did big data with healthcare and a health services research team gives me just a really interesting view into some of the problems we have, some of the opportunities that we have, and a beginning answer to that question, which is, can big data fix healthcare? And so I want to take you on not a whirlwind tour, but a quick sightseeing tour. So welcome aboard. Come on aboard to USS Healthcare. Find a seat. Any place, any place at all. Having a problem? Can't find a place to sit? Are you having a hard time? I can't imagine why. It's our biggest vessel in the fleet. My god, it's the most expensive one we have. We spend over $3 trillion a year just keeping that baby afloat. I don't know why you're having a problem. And yet we do have a problem. And I don't want to belabor the problem. Everybody talks about it. And sometimes we talk about it so long, we never actually get around to talking about solutions. So I don't want to belabor it, but I do want to level set. We do have a problem. When you look here at this graph, one of the problems is not just that our vessel is so damned expensive, but the rate at which costs are increasing to maintain USS healthcare is growing by leaps and bounds. It's like the blob. So what you can see here is that the cost per person, your cost, what we attribute to you, in 2005 was $7,000. You feel like you got $7,000 worth of value? Absolutely not. And it's actually going to go to $12,000 in 2015. That's per person here in the United States. And what's alarming, if you look at the bottom, is the rate at which it's grown. From 1970, the things that you buy, you know, the things you eat, you know, the things you put on your feet, the things you put in your home have gone up fivefold. For healthcare, it's gone up almost 19-fold. In an article that Atul Gawande wrote and published in, in, and I would recommend that you read it, called Hotspotters, he said, for every dollar in Massachusetts that they put into education reform, they had to pay out a dollar and 40 cents just to fund the increase in health care costs that they had as obligations for the state. We simply can't afford it anymore. You hear about the usual suspects, things like we're getting older, we're getting sicker, we're getting lazier, we're getting you know, um, new technologies all the time, a culture of abundance, an expectation that, that there is more and that more is better. And these are true. Um, but there's something underneath that. There's an underlying problem, and it's that it's a bad business model. These issues are only now starting to be recognized, and that what this is, we need a phase change. The business model that we have today worked 30, 40 years ago, but it doesn't work anymore. We have a business model that pays for sickness, not health. It's highly specialized. We have supply-induced demand that's been well documented. We have a very passive patient culture. The etymology of the word patient means silent sufferer. All right? Fee for service patient or payment. Every time that you want to do something, it's this kind of more is better, this activity trap that we're in. On top of an, a, a mentality that is other people's money with no real constraint in a reimbursement mechanism that is so deeply rooted and rigid that the center of our information universe has become 
the billable code. Can I bill it? If I can, it'll happen, and sometimes far too often. And the real issue is that there's no knowledge architecture on which to learn what works and what doesn't. So we have a lot of information infrastructure, but it, it's all related to how do things get paid, not whether or not treatments work. And so it's like riding a two horses ass gauge track on a train that doesn't have any brakes. So is healthcare broken or is it just poorly designed? You got to remember, because just because it sucks, don't mean it's broke. But you also have to remember that just because something ain't broke doesn't mean you can't change it. And that's the issue. What has worked well before doesn't work now. And the opportunity for us, you know, we, have, we face insurmountable opportunities, as Pogo Possum said. So let's get to work. And that means all of you. Remember three things. The first one, never underestimate resistance to change. Second, pick good problems. We'll talk about that. Third, your data will suck. And you got to get over it and get on with it. Back to the first one. One person's cost is another person's income. This is 18% of the GDP. People who make money off of this will not go you know, quietly into that good night. This will be a fight. Look to redesign not necessarily to fix. People will bring you things that actually aren't broken. They're actually not problems. They actually need to be dissolved. And third, don't always look to what's there. Look to what's missing. The second, pick good problems. Focus on hotspots. Atul Gawande's January 24 article talked about hotspots. I might call them a trim tab. It's that little piece that means a lot. A trim tab, how many people, does anybody know what one is? OK, a few people in the room. You have a giant vessel, the USS Healthcare. That is a massive, massive vessel. And it is turned by something much smaller. That small rudder is actually turned by a very tiny, tiny rudder called a trim tab. And so there are places where you can release tremendous value by doing a little that had, can have a tremendous impact. Those are called hot spots. They're all over the place. Read the article, um, and, and, and you'll find out what those mean. The second is achieve the triple aim. Don Berwick, who is now head of CMS, who was formerly the founder and president of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, coined the phrase, and it means that to, to actually change and transform healthcare, you actually have to do three things, not just one. Anybody can reduce cost, and you can do it the easy way or the hard way. But you, if you do three things simultaneously, you know you're there. Improve health, reduce cost, and improve or enhance the experience of care. Do all three. And for you, I give you a fourth. Build the needed knowledge architectures. These are the pieces that are missing. And to that point, yes, your data will suck. Get over it. I've worked with it a lot. Learn to focus on identity. Who is a person resolving an identity disambiguation and resolution is the most important thing. You are you, and yet I promise you they can't link up all your data you know, to save their souls. It's going to be hard. Focus on activity and on interaction, not just on the financial aspects. And a lot of people talk about health IT, but it's more than technology. It's not just pipes. It's the thing that runs through them that actually has the value. Don't just focus on the technology. Focus on content, and that's data. It's metadata, and it's semantic interoperability so that when one person says something, it means the same thing when another person says it. OK, so I actually want to talk to you about one problem that we looked at. And this is around adverse drug events. I don't want you to meet my friend. Her name is Tabitha. We call her Tabby. Yeah. And we worked at this at Humana. And so this is a story that I wanted to share with you about big data applied to healthcare. And the reason that we went down this road was that at Humana, we, this was a Medicare health plan. And so we had about 1.2, 1.5 million people that we served that were part of Medicare. And yet, that was not the lion's share of our membership, but it was the lion's share of our business, top line and bottom line. About 70% of our top and bottom line was Medicare because older folks cost more, right? Okay. And it was at a time when 
the government was looking at drug safety. And drug safety was a huge issue, and the FDA just launched a Sentinel effort, and it was all about finding the next bad drug, you know, the next Vioxx, the next Vandia. What's the next drug when it comes on the market is actually doing harm? And that's a great thing. But what about all the drugs, the over 100 billion tablets that flowed out of U.S. retail pharmacies in 2009, which are glued all over Tabitha? What about those issues? Are those all safe? They're safer. You know, they go through, they remove drugs from the market, but they're not completely safe. What about the risk? And so we wanted to focus on those. Research knew that there was an issue. They said, look, the adverse drug event prevalence is high. Anywhere between 10 and 21% of admissions are caused by an adverse reaction to drugs that you take, either because combinations of drugs or drugs with your condition. These are not errors. These are, these are drugs that are prescribed and taken as intended, and just bad things happen to good people. It's a big issue. The annual cost of Medicare is huge. It's between 25 and $50 billion a year. And research also has shown that the vast majority of these in seniors are preventable. So what's the problem? The problem, and there's a whole litany of things why they happen, and these are all true. But the dirty little secret is we don't know what they look like. When an adverse drug event happens and your mama or your grandma ends up in the hospital, they don't know necessarily that it was an adverse drug event. They know it was an admission. They say something's wrong with their heart. But it's rarely documented as an adverse drug event. Fewer than anywhere between 1 and 10% of admissions that are caused by that are actually documented as that. There's very few knowledge bases of all of the known con conflicts that research has said in small studies. This could cause a problem. This could cause a problem. And if it does, it looks like that. Those are not widely available, and the few that are there are not open. You got to pay for them. And so we set ourselves about looking at this problem. And so we said, OK, we're at Humana. We've got some data. It's but ugly, but it was organized. And so what we did was we conducted a study on this 1.2 million seniors. And we fused all of our claims data, which has all the diagnosis and procedure codes and everything that has happened to a person over time, with a knowledge base. So we found one. And it said, here's a summary of all of the research that's been done. And when, these, when bad things happen, if they happen, they look like that. All of those things on 1.2 million people actually added up to 23 million triggers of potential events. Might happen, might happen, might happen. Only 0.55% of those triggers actually converted to an adverse event, by which I mean it's an admission or an emergency room visit. But the annual cost of those events was over $500 million to Humana. Humana had only made $800 million that year. And you go, and what if, half, what if we could prevent half of those? What if we could turn adverse drug events into preventable harm? Wouldn't that be absolutely fascinating? But you can't prevent what you can't predict. And it's a rare event. It's kind of like you know, working at the old earthquake prediction. Well, maybe now, no, now, no, now, no, now. And so, so we said, all right, we've done this huge study. We know it's there. We think we know what they look like. But it's a separate task to gear up the computational engines to say, can I predict it? And can I predict not just something that's likely to happen, but something that's very rare? And so we used the results and the data assets to build a predictive model. It was an eight-week pencils down proof of concept. Can you do better than a coin flip? And we did. And the initial performance of that, the area under the rock curve, was 0.8. It was absolutely phenomenal. And so what I'm telling you is that we didn't find the answer. This was not a perfect model. This is not perfect data. We created a way to begin. And so can you. In this particular case, what I would have done had I stayed, and I would recommend that somebody else do this, is start where you are. Use the available data from payers, from Medicare. Learn to recognize what they look like with what we have. 
and then build models as accurately as possible. And what you do, it's not the model that counts, the magic is in the service. Launch the ADT of drug safety, a new service, and use that as a platform. Harness open science approaches to continually upgrade algorithms, to continually bring in new data, and to invite people into clinical studies where you can develop new classes of drug safety diagnostics. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't face insurmountable opportunities, but thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me here. Big data is an idea whose time has come in healthcare, and I welcome you to join us on the ride. Thank you.